Hello, this is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is a pleasure to be before you to bring our lesson for this Sunday, December the 27th, 2020. And we are on lesson four out of our uh, winter session of study, and still in unit one, the beginning of a call. And this Sunday's lesson is entitled, Get Ready, from our Faith Pathway Manual. And again, the subject or title for the lesson is, Get Ready. And our key verse is from the book of Matthew. Uh, let me read uh, the other verses in the study of our lesson. Our devotional reading is John, the book of John, the first chapter, verses 19 through 34. And I would add here that it is definitely a precursor to understanding uh, John's role and John's purpose as we indulge into the study of our lesson. Our background scripture is the third chapter of Matthew, and then our printed passage is the third chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. And now we will read our key verse. And our key verse is the third chapter of Matthew and the third verse. And it says, This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And our lesson's aims are to recognize the reality of sin and the necessity of repentance. Identify with John the Baptist in his call to prepare the way for Christ. Repent of your sins and bear witness to this repentance through your deed. And our lesson is divided into three parts or three sections. And the first is entitled The Path. And then the second is entitled The Plea. And our last is entitled The Promise. So The Path, The Plea, and the promised. And as always, uh, we ask that the Spirit of God will be present with us in this study of God's Word, and that as we indulge ourselves into the wording of Scripture, that the Spirit of God will reveal unto us the things that God would have us to know, and then also compel and convict us by God's Spirit, that we will be strengthened to go out and to exemplify and to live the things that we have learned. As we begin to uh, go over our lesson, uh, we definitely want to say to our listeners, uh, to our Pleasant Green Church family, uh, we wish or we uh, hope and pray that everyone had a blessed Christmas and that we were all reminded and again we showed signs of appreciation uh, for the gift 
that God gave to the world. And uh, we know that uh, uh, we could not uh, be in comparison or parallel uh, the gift that God gave to the world. But we do recognize that God gave a singular gift that was fitting and needed for all the world. Uh, in our giving of gifts one to another, uh, we sometimes uh, give what we ourselves and those who receive the gifts, we give what is wanted. But God gave what was needed. And it's good for us to reflect and recognize that God gave the same gift to all the people of the world, which would send a message to us to recognize that all the world, God saw that all the world needed the same gift. So God didn't deviate and give one gift to South America and another one to Asia and another one to the Middle East and another one to North America and another one to Australia. But God gave the same gift to all of God's creation, recognizing that all of us were in need of the same gift. So now let us uh, begin into uh, unfolding what this Sunday's lesson has directed us towards. And it is, it opens up in the introduction. Uh, it begins to set a tone that many of us uh, will be uh, now proceeding into the new year according to the Gregorian calendar that we use. Uh, we're going into now the beginning of another year full of God's blessings, grace, and mercy. And as we approach it, uh, we will be bombarded with commercials and everybody marketing and trying to sell the nuances of newness. Uh, it's time for a makeover. Uh, it's time to uh, get rid of uh, some things that are old. Uh, it's time to replace things. It's time to give the house a facelift. Uh, it's time to uh, uh, take part in new associations, uh, new social gatherings. Uh, bring some newness into your life. And then many of us will again make those promises about uh, new resolutions. Uh, this year, I'm not going to do this. This year, I'm going to stop that. This year, I'm going to get rid of those things. This year, this year, this year. And so, uh, when we look at uh, the significance of this, uh, John is confronted with somewhat the same uh, significance, the same drive, the same urgency of renewing ourselves. And John's phrase for the renewing was to first recognize our wrongdoings and use the word of repentance. And so, as we look into our lesson, and uh, I think that there was 
some great statements were made uh, in the introduction uh, because it caused us to ask ourselves some very important questions such as what am I doing to encourage the behavior I want to change? And then it, 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 it speaks further and it tells us that some of the greatest le resolutions on earth will fail because we speak them, we speak of them if old habits are not replaced with new ones. So uh, let me restate that again. The greatest resolutions on earth will fail before you speak them if old habits are not replaced with new ones. And then it says, resolutions have no power without discipline, effort, and a changed mind. And change only happens when we acknowledge wrong attitudes and behaviors and sincerely seek to do something different. And as we look into the lesson and John the Baptist mission, we will recognize again that the plea from John is, is that we would repent, that we would change our old habits and behavioral patterns, and that we would discipline ourselves so that we could move forward and then begin to witness and be the recipients of the changes that we made and, and recognize and receive the rewards of the changes that we made. So it begins by saying in those days, John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness of Judea and he was saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he quotes a passage from the book of Isaiah. And he identifies that he is a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And I would like to read uh, that from the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Because... Not only does it just end with the third verse uh, mentioning, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight, but it goes further and it, it gives us a, a, a more of a, a depth and insight into uh, the advent of John, John's uh, appearance, John's purpose. And, and what John was trying to prepare the recipients to receive. And so the 40th chapter of Isaiah and the third verse is, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken so when we look at these contrasting changes, it talks about that low places are going to be exalted, are going to be raised. And then it says that every mountain, high places, esteemed places, places that have been placed on pedestals, that those are going to be lowed, brought down. And then it tells us that the crooked places, 
that those will become straight and then the rough places are going to be made smooth. And it says that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so what we recognize is, is that John is coming in to prepare a people to realize that the fulfillment of God's word is among them, is in their midst. And what God had promised has now been placed within the presence of the people of that time and that these things are about to take place. And so uh, when we look at the time, of course, it said in those days, and uh, uh, history tells us that during this time, it was in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Uh, the dating tells us it was around about 37 CE, the Common Era. Of course, Rome uh, was the country that was in control at the time. Uh, they, Rome was the power uh, on earth at the time, the government of Rome, the authority of Rome, and the military of Rome. And so when we uh, look at the setting here, uh, we recognize uh, another issue which uh, is somewhat alluded to in the lesson, uh, but we will highlight it and lift it for uh, observation and thought. And that is, is that uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, uh, John's voice was received uh, by a large group of people that were just identified as outcast. But among this people had developed a longing for the voice of God in their midst. And so when we look at uh, the setting uh, from the book of Malachi, until we get to the New Testament, we have a period which is referred to as the silent years. And uh, theologians had agreed upon that there is a phase of time, 400 years of what they identify or refer to as that God was silent. But when we understand that God is always present at all times, everywhere at the same time, we recognize then that it was not that God was silent, but it was that the mechanisms of man had so blotted out the hearing of the people until there was a vacuum, a time where the people were not listening to what God was saying. And so they referred to it as when other governments and other forms of rulership were developing, it blotted out what people had be, been uh, accustomed to and hearing. And so it was identified as the silent years. That prompted the people for hearing a voice from God. And when John began to speak in the wilderness in an area where people had moved away from metropolitan settings. 
And many of them had moved to remote areas to be freed from the shenanigans that were going on in some of these other social and metropolitan uh, uh, gatherings and recognizing that uh, it was not of God and they chose to remove themselves from those areas and they were considered uh, to be outcast. But when they began to hear what John was saying, there was a receptive heart. Uh, they, they were receptive because uh, John's message was different from that of the other teachings that they were hearing during this time. And so when John began to speak of repent, they knew that they themselves needed to correct themselves. They needed change. They needed to undo the things that uh, created a barrier between them and the Spirit of God. And they knew they needed to repent of their sins meaning they recognized they needed to change. They needed to change themselves. And first they had to humble themselves to make themselves receptive for what they could visually see and physically hear that now the voice of God is speaking to us again. And so God has sent his messenger and uh, the identity of John, these are things that we need to really highlight here because uh, when we think about the groups that were uh, um, among this era, we have uh, the Pharisees, uh, we have the Sadducees, uh, we have the Essenes, the Essenes, uh, we have the... Uh, uh, zealots. Uh, we have these uh, different groups uh, representing uh, different uh, governances. Uh, they formed uh, based on different beliefs and traditions and things that they represented. They all were against the control and rulership of Rome, but from different perspectives. And many of them uh, were very devout in wanting to be removed from the control of Rome, like the Essenes and the uh, Zealots. They wanted to... Uh, be totally withdrawn from Rome, but then uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they too did not appreciate the control of Rome, but they had different motives as to how they would govern themselves in the midst of Roman control. But the point that we should focus upon is, is that when God sent the messenger, John the Baptist, he didn't send John through any of these other groups that were identified by Roman authority. He didn't choose any of the other groups to send John through or by. But what he did was he raised John up in an area where John would be free from the confusion and the conflict and the uh, influential persuasion from one group to another. He brings John up in an area where he would have solitude and would not have these conflicting uh, uh, doctrines and teachings and customs and traditions. 
But he brings John up in the wilderness area where John would only be in uh, contact and in relationship with God and God's purpose. And so when we, when we uh, look at this and realize that when God does things, God doesn't need the help of other organizations. God doesn't need the uh, recognition of other social gatherings. God doesn't need the approval of certain assemblies and societies uh, and groups that feel that uh, we can get you into these areas. We have uh, uh, we have allegiance with uh, these different forms, and I know this uh, elected official, and I can get you in with this group over here, and I have the backing of these people over here. God doesn't need any of that, and God doesn't want his chosen to be persuaded by any of that so therefore he brings John up in an area which is free from all the noise that sometimes uh, causes us not to hear what God is saying and so uh, it tells us that uh, John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness and then it talks about John's apparel. And sometimes uh, we are impressed with outer appearances. Uh, but here, uh, John's apparel was more receptive to the people to whom John was sent because they too were people who were not adorned with the finest of linens. And so they recognize that this person not only speaks a voice, a message which we have not heard, but also looks like us, can identify with us. And John's speech, sometimes we're so impressed uh, with the speech of people from groups that are adversaries uh, to uh, God's way. But we're impressed uh, with their titles and with their connections and with who they know and where they went. And so uh, here John, though, is uh, he has a message that is received by the people it has a uh, magnetic pull for the lack of a better phrase it connects to the people but john's not a part of the establishment many times in order for god to use us effectively god has to remove us from the establishment and john was such a man and when we go further into the lesson and it talks about, uh, oh, uh, it mentions something else too here. I think uh, uh, we'll just address this and move on. But it even talks about John's diet. Uh, it was not uh, in comparison with the diet of what those leaders of that day were, were, uh, uh, were eating. Uh, it, it almost makes it seem detestful, but even in this day and time, it talks about the locusts and uh, honey were a part of John's uh, diet. Uh, but in still to this day, in uh, other parts of the world and other countries, uh, the diet of insects uh, is still uh, a normal practice in other parts of the world. And sometimes we identify these things as like delicacies. Uh, we, we, uh, we're kind of like drawn to uh, the description of 
uh, chocolate covered ladybugs and chocolate covered crickets and ants and and these things are like out of the norm and so but uh doing this time I just bring this up because it mentions it and sometimes we think that these are things that are far removed uh, from us uh, but these are things that are still present with us even in this day and time uh, now when we look at the plea John here talks about uh, his areas that he went out to Jerusalem to Judea and around the Jordan and he was baptizing people and having them to confess their sins a part of uh, the repentance is the word penitence and when we think of the word uh, penitence it it simply means that we recognize that there are some things that we've done and we're not proud of them we are ashamed uh we recognize there we have faults uh, we have wrongdoings and it humbles us when we realize that we need correction and so a part of the repentance act is to first identify our penitence and then uh, respond in like manner so that we uh, try to undo what caused it. And that is the part of repentance. And so while John is baptizing at the Jordan, uh, he saw out uh, in the crowd and the scripture uh, says it like this but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized and he said to them you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath produce fruit in keeping with repentance and so here what we realize is is that John understood the social status of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. John recognized that uh, their conversation and their message was different. And John identifies uh, them. He doesn't speak in mild terms. Uh, John appears to be someone who is straightforward, direct, and to the point. And he doesn't waste valuable time by using soft uh, approaches, beating around the bush, trying to get to where he could have just eliminated that wasted time and hit the nail right on the head. And so John uh, says to them, uh, mm, look who's here. We have these brood of vipers. He's like, who warned you to come out and try and free yourself from the coming wrath which is about to fall upon you? And uh, he tells them to bring fruit in the keeping of their repentance. He says to them that they should produce this fruit. So here we, we recognize that uh, John is saying to them, and when we speak of the vipers, uh, these are relative to snakes that spew out poisons. So what John was saying to them is, is that uh, their teaching was poisonous, that uh, they were not giving to the people the things that would uh, strengthen them, that would rebuild them, that would give them uh, direction. But instead, uh, they were uh, groups that were a part of the cause and the reason that the masses needed the repentance. But John also recognize that they themselves were not coming to be repentive, but they were just coming to hear what was being said and to argue John's position and John's 
uh, appointment. And so John tells them that if you're here for the correct reason, then you need to bear fruits of repentance. Fruits are the offspring of what's been planted in you. Then I need to see evidence. I need to see the produce of the fact that you are here for repentance. So I should see some good works. I sh there should be some good produce coming from you. And if not, then the tree that you are from needs to be destroyed. And so when we look at the promise here, and John says to them, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. See, sometimes we like to uh, verify our position and verify uh, our uh, our fault or either our response to a certain accusation. Uh, we like to tell you, well, first of all, uh, you don't know who I'm connected to. See, you don't know where I come from. Let me let me give you a spill on my background. Let me uh, let me explain to you, you know, the people I come from, my lineage, who who I am a product of. You know, I am from Abraham. So then John tells them that uh, that their being from the lineage of Abraham uh, didn't amount to much. Because he says to them that God is able to make these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. The, the point here is that it would not even be necessary for God to do so if they were already acting as though they were of the seed of Abraham. There would be no cause to replace what is already correct. So he's explaining to them that just your association through your lineage means nothing if you're not being productive. So as we read further into our lesson, it says that I indeed baptize with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he were baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he's speaking of Christ, of course. And when we uh, look again, I bring this up, when we look at the first chapter of John, verses 19 through 34, it really explains to us John recognizing his place and not stepping out of his place. He stays, as we say in this day and time, he stays in his lane. When we read this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, they were trying to... Uh, as John, so who are you? Are you Elijah? Uh, well, well, who are you? Are you the Christ? Well, well, who are you then? By what authority are you speaking from? You know, who, who, what backing do you have? Uh, and John then recites to them the beginning of Isaiah, the 40th chapter, and starting at the third verse. And he tells them, I am just one a voice crying in the wilderness, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so John doesn't take an opportunity here to, uh, okay, I think what I'll do is this would be a chance for me to step up. Uh, this would be a chance for me to advance myself. Uh, this, this is my opportunity. I, I better not let this pass. But John tells them that, I'm just the forerunner. I'm just the person to alert you to what is about to happen. But the one that comes after me, I'm not even able to tie his shoes up. But here is what you need to look for. And that is, is that the one that comes after me, he has a winnowing fan in his hand. 
and he will clear his way by a threshing on the floor. He begins to talk to them about a process that they are familiar with. And this is when they were separating the produce of the crops they planted, wheat being the one in reference. And a winnowing fan is like a uh, reed uh, flat surface twined together. And what they would do is they would place the wheat in the tray. And they called it the winnowing fan because they would toss the wheat up and down from the tray. And the wind would carry the chaff away because it was lighter. Plus, it was not good. It was like the husk from a residue that built around the wheat. And it was not good for human digestion. And so they would separate it by process using a winnowing fan. And this would allow that which was good to remain in the receptor. But that which was not good for human consumption was blown into the wind and removed. And some that was left and separated, that would be burned, that which was no good and of no value and of no purpose. Only that which was substantive, which was going to lead to improvement, which was going to be good for the inner being, which was going to be good for human consumption, only that would remain. And John was saying to them that, the one who's coming after me, the Christ, when he comes, he is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the spirit of this individual is going to perform uh, something far better than the water baptism. Because the water baptism is a ceremonial ritual which we do to say that we are dead to our old self, but we have been renewed to our new self by the submergence into the water. And water, uh, many times, even uh, in the pregnant process of women, when the water breaks, we know that it is time for the new life to come. And so water scripturally had been used uh, to say that when you come out of the water, you are a new being, a new person. Unfortunately, sometimes we go in a dry center and we come out a wet center. And the cleansing that was supposed to take place, it was only a outward practice, but it was not internal. And so what John is telling them is that the one, the Christ, the Messiah, the one I told you to uh, prepare ye the way, make straight his paths. When he comes, his spirit will be like a fire. It will burn out that which is of no value. And that which remains will have undergone the test of the fire, fire being used as a form and as a means of purifying certain things. It removes the impurity and it leaves that which is of good use for God. As usual, we hope that something has been said, or something has been lifted through our lesson uh, that will be fruitful for us and as we go into this uh, new year uh, and uh, something in the lesson that was said was so meaningful uh, it mentioned that we don't have to wait until the new year to start something new you know, sometimes we just get so engulfed into dictates of the calendar but we could do something new in June we could do something new in November, and uh, 
whichever time, whenever we choose, God is always there at the door knocking. And if we open the door and let God in, then he will sup with us. God bless you and God keep you is always our prayer.